ever so often, every so often, um, you and I get to watch on TV or maybe on social media a short clip, a short video clip that captures the story of someone's life who has been turned around. Uh, usually set to slow moving graphics, great cinematography, those type of swell kind of music about how maybe a former drug addict or maybe how a former gambler just turn, their life has been turned around. Uh, and this kind of story has been used, true stories and also fictional stories have been used in every conceivable way. The latest I watched was a story um, similar done by Maybank, uh, us telling us that conversations heal. So you, every so often you and I get these stories of great change and new life. And as I was worshipping together with you just now, as Roy led us, I'm just amazed that each one of our stories could be made into that kind of movie, that kind of video clip. Yes, many of us don't think about our stories as being spectacular or like, is there really something for me to transform from old to new? But actually, in reality, and according to the Word of God, each of our stories, each of our lives is such a story where you and I are new. In fact, today, as we explore in God's Word, this idea of old and new, the word of God that has been upon my heart for several weeks now, maybe even months, has been 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, which says, if anyone, anybody, doesn't matter who, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature, a new creation, someone new. Someone made new. And the old has passed away. Always gone. The word pass away is almost intentional to mean dead. No longer here with us. And the new has come. Or the new is here. It's a powerful verse that we hear often enough. But I want to ask you, as some of your friends may also ask you, and this season of Chinese New Year, there's going to be a lot of opportunity when people talk. And this might happen, but even if it doesn't, or if it does, I want to ask you, what is the old referred to here? What is passed away? What is gone? What is the new that is referred to here? What's new about you? What's the new creature? What's the new that is now come? And what difference does that make now, this moment, as you and I sit even together in a worship service? What difference does it make to you tomorrow when you are in your school, in your workplace, when we are in our homes with our families? What difference does it make? This old and new. Okay, so I don't want to just give answers like Singapore education system seems to suggest we should, lah, right? I like us to think about this, and I like us to share your thoughts briefly with one another. Let me give you a few moments to think. And I'm going to ask you to find a partner nearby. One or two can, no problem. And I like you to share with him or her what's the old, what's the new. And what difference does it make? And I'd like you to listen to one another's answers. And if there's a li- if you all share really quickly, you'll have some time to be able to discuss or clarify a bit further. But let me ask you to think about it for a moment. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. She's a new creature. What old has passed away? What new is here? What's old? What's new? Give us half a minute and I'll ask you to share. Concisely, precisely.
this verse describes you. You are new. Can you tell the difference? What's old? What's new? And so what today? Alright, if you've thought about it, now find a partner quickly. Let me give you about a minute or two minutes and share briefly with one another what's new, what's old, and what difference does it make. Go! Some of the conversations I overhear are the old habits, the old values, the old patterns of behavior are gone. And what's new is new opportunities, new behaviors, new methods of thinking. It's here now. Not bad. Not bad, I agree. And that would be wonderful if like with our lives, like at Chinese New Year, you could do spring cleaning and then 今天是除夕, suddenly like, wow, 明天, wow, everything new. Eh. Wouldn't that be great? But as you say, as we speak like this to each other and even to especially non-Christians, imagine, from their perspective, they're looking at you and I and saying, really, man? The old you, the old habit, that I know of you a long time, bro. Seriously? Is it gone? New opportunities? Hmm? Really? Say, for example, this is you and me. And this is some, this is biblical psychology and scientific psychology 101. The Bible and also the Science of research, which backs up the Bible, interestingly, tells us that we all have a mind. We all can think. We all have the ability to process thought. We also all have a heart. Not the boop, 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 heart, but we use the heart to describe not just cognition, but feelings, emotions. So we think and we feel. And in addition to that, we have one other element that sets us apart from animals, by the way as the debate rages on if animals can think, and some of the high-functioning animals seem like they can think, some of the higher-functioning animals seem like they can have emotions, but animals, as yet, we can't prove, and that's the difference between a human and an animal, and God says it in Genesis 1, is that you have a will. You have the ability, as the psychologists tell us, to choose from among many desires. You have many desires, many thoughts and feelings, and you can choose and pick one and commit to that for a reasonable amount of time. That's will. An animal doesn't have the ability, at least as far as we know it today, to weigh the different desires or the thinking or the emotions in their hearts. Animals still, by and large, respond by instinct. But you and I have a will made in the image of God. And indeed, God has mind and heart and will. And that's why we can say that these components that you and I, by the way, can't see physically, but 
can know is there from the outcome of what happens make up our person, or some people say personality. What sets apart someone as unique is their mind, their heart, and their will, or the parts that you can't see, it's not you can't touch. The non-physical part we sometimes call the soul. The Bible supports this throughout, and it will be too long to go through all the details. Old and New Testament and social science and psychology science tells us this true. You're unique because of the way you think, the way you feel, and the will that you have. None of us is identical exactly in all these three things, these elements that make up our personhood or personality. Unique. And these being things that you can't touch or feel physically, they're your soul. You're a soul. You're a unique being. But of course, you and I know that you and I have a body as well. And you put the body together with these three elements, you get the whole person, the human person. So while God has mind, will and heart and therefore is a person, the Bible describes God as a person. He has personality. He has all the elements that make up a uniqueness of an individual mind, heart and will. He doesn't have the body like we have. So we are unique in that we have a body with person that makes us human. Well, now you can sound really intelligent when you speak to uh, people around you. Like, hey, let me tell you a little bit. Took a lot of research. And the four elements here, mind, will, heart and body, are inseparable. You know that from experience, especially if you've known depressed people or you've been through depression, right? Your mind has such a powerful influence over even your body that your body becomes weak as a result of just the thoughts that are raging through your brain. And the thoughts are not physical things, but it has an effect on the physical. The reverse is true. Don't eat well, don't sleep well, and soon your emotions and your thinking starts to get a bit cranky, a bit weird. It's fused together, cannot separate out in that sense. But of course, we know that the body is something that's in the flesh or in, that you can touch and feel and the rest of it is the soul. Put together, that's our humanness. Now the Bible describes this, you and I, as what can be seen. And I put in apostrophe because, yeah, you can't really see someone's emotions except when it's expressed. But this is what the Bible says is what's seeable, observable, or what is the things that can identify a person. This is a person's appearance. These can be seen in the flesh. So sometimes the Bible uses the word flesh. This is the natural being, the natural person, the world, the created world, human being. So that's who you and I are. So I ask again, if today you are a new creature, new creation, what's different? What's really old? Has your mind ceased to exist? From the day before and the day after, or from the minute before or the minute after, you say, Yes, Lord, I receive you as Savior. Did suddenly something happen in your Will? Is it really completely new? Is your body any different? Are you sure that all these four things are totally transformed at that instant? So that all the habits and the values and all the patterns of our behavior, the moment we receive Christ, are immediately transformed because I'm new. Is that really true? Our answers are our answers adequate? Would our friends ask us, are you sure? Or oh, that's just a cool idea. My prayer has been that as we look into God's word today, we'll be able to explain this and more, that oneness and newness clearly, not only for others' benefit, but also for our own. If we can answer the question, what is old about me, what's new about me, immediately and simply, it will define the difference that it makes for us today. 
But there's so much of this to explore that we can't cover everything in less than an hour. We just explore one or two key big ideas today. So please join me. Turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And in order to get a fuller understanding, we'll look at the verses before and after from 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 18. And see if this understanding that we have is adequate or let God complete our understanding of owners and newness. Dear God, as we read your word now, we pray that it will be your spirit who tutors us and not just the words or speech of a human being or not just the thoughts or ideas of our human beingness. Speak to us in spiritual truths, true spiritual ways by your Spirit. That each of us here who is new may understand what that is and live in that newness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 14. Paul and Timothy writing to the church of Corinth, that's in Greece, and also to all the people of God throughout Archaea. We learn this from the first verse of this letter. He says, Christ's love compels you and me. Or Christ's love controls you and me. The word there in Greek means to hold tightly together. The love of God holds us tightly together to Him because we are convinced or we have concluded that one has died for all and therefore all have died. Christ's love compels me. So if you ask yourself the question, what's the difference between the old me and the new me? At one turning point, Suddenly, from that point onwards, Paul says, truly, now speaking about him, his new life now, and same for all of us, I am controlled, I am driven by, I am held up, I am held close, I am compelled by the love of God to me. And here is the evidence, verse 14, second half, because one person has died, Jesus has died, has died for all, and therefore, all have died. This is the first of four observations about the difference between old and new. We will get to the summary eventually, but let's follow with Paul what he's saying. As a new creature, I am compelled, I am controlled by God's love. Everything I do starts from His love to me. Think about that. Everything I am, everything I do begins with an understanding and experience of God's love for me whether it is my stewardship, how I give my thigh, how I spend my time, what I do with my ability, everything starts from the point of understanding God's love for me. How I go through suffering, how I express my sexuality, verse 13, actually, if you reverse one more verse, Paul, in fact, says, sometimes it looks like we are out of our mind, as some people would say. Other times it looks like we are in our right mind, but all of this is for God or is for you. It's all because God's love really drives and controls me. Everything about my life stems from God's love to me. Now, that is a significant statement. But let's go on, there's more. Verse 15, as we look at the evidence of God's love for us, that He died for all, that all who believe should live, then anyone who lives should no longer live for themselves, but live for Him who died for them and who was raised again. Second observation about the difference between the old and the new is that from that point on, I live for God. I don't live for myself any longer, explicitly mentioned to us. So not only that everything about me 
stems from the love of God to me, but everything about me now is about God. Everything I do, everything I am is tied to Him, is shaped by Him. God is the center or the focus of all aspects of my life for all my life. I hope you're not hearing what some people would say are motherhood statements now, dear church. Because if you cannot understand the difference, if I cannot understand the difference between old and new, simply and clearly and fully, then in some way uh, we are living like this picture shows, are no different from the old. The character here on the left and the character there on the right is exactly the same for now. So we need to think deeply. When God says, when Paul teaches us that as a new creature, two marks. One, I am controlled by Christ's love. And that implies before we were controlled by something else. And number two, now everything about my life is about God first whether it's my character, my personality, whether it's my career, my work, whether it's my calling, my ministry, whether it's my relationships with my friends, with, in my marriage, with my children, with my parents, with my church, with strangers, everything is done with God the center or God the focus or God the highest point of it all. My values, my philosophy, my life principles, my perspectives, my source of truth, everything now stem from God. Everything about us is tied to God if we are a new creation. Paul clearly writes, I no longer live for myself. I live for God. That's a very powerful word to say. I used to do everything for me. Everything was about me. My career choice, my character, my calling, my relationships, my values. Everything was about me, me, me. But now everything is about God. Everything is determined by God. Everything is tied to God. I have given up my life to God, for God. Jesus says this in many ways in the Gospels. He says, if anyone were to come after me, he needs to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, and do this daily. Daily, in every way, denying myself. Daily, in every way, taking up my cross, the call that he has for me. And every day, following Jesus. It's an astounding thing that God is saying. And because it's so astounding, verse 16, when these are true of someone, when you see in so-and-so's life that Christ's love controls them. Everything they do is stemming from the love of God. Whether they visit someone in the hospital or they do any form of service or what they say or what they, they, how they live, how they spend money, everything is stemming from the love that they have for God and the love that they know God has for them and everything about them is linked to God. Wow, when you see someone like this, then you know, hey, there must be something different. Verse 16. Therefore, we know that that point on, we don't see, we don't regard anyone any longer from a worldly point of view. Though at once, one time we saw or we regarded Christ this way, now we do so no longer. If these two things are so true of someone that you know, or yourself for the matter, then you know something has happened or something different about this person. And Paul gives us an example in Christ. He says, him, Paul himself, he uses the word we, and the other disciples, and Timothy, and we, the church, we used to see Christ 
just from a worldly or from a natural perspective. We saw Jesus, imagine this is Jesus here. We saw Jesus as merely a human being. A carpenter or woodworker who lived and grew up in Israel and was born in Israel and lived in Nazareth. We see him merely from a natural perspective, what we can see of his mind, his heart, his will and his body. We think of Jesus as a good teacher, a great prophet, a wonderful healer, a loving helper. That's the way that everyone used to see Jesus. But then, when we stop seeing him that way, but we see him for who he really is, when we stop seeing according to the human perspective, the worldly view, when we stop seeing just in the natural, but we see in the supernatural, we see Jesus, not merely as a human being, we see him full of the spirit, we see him as a spirit and human merged together. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. Perfectly integrated human and spirit inseparable. That's what I'm trying to describe here with this diagram, this picture. That is the difference between the old and the new. You still have a mind. And sometimes that mind is very similar to the one before. You and I still have emotions. And as a non-Christian or as a Christian, sometimes those emotions are very similar. We still have a will. How we prioritize things in life often hasn't changed. We still have the same body. That's why I can see you today and tomorrow you receive Christ. I may not tell the difference because I see in the natural I see the same thinking, the same feeling, the same choosing, the same body. But if we learn to see beyond the natural, we see the supernatural, then we know, ah, something is different. And what is true of Jesus is, the tr- is true also of his disciples. Paul says, just like we saw Jesus once naturally, but see him now spiritually. We look at one another who are new, who are in Christ, and we see each other not just naturally, but also spiritually. I don't recognize you merely by the way you comb your hair, or the style of your talking, or what you do, or your usual patterns. I say, hey, there's something different about you. More and more, your life is controlled by the love that God has poured into you. And more and more, your life is being connected with what God has in store for you. You are a new creature. This explains why when someone goes from old to new, even though we are new today, there's still sin in our lives. Because the mind and the heart and the will and even the body are not completely transformed in an instant. Explains why Christians still sin. It explains why for the disciple of Jesus there's often an internal struggle. You're like, no, I don't want to fall into this temptation. I don't want to commit this sin. But, oh, there's a struggle because you are fighting two wills, the will of yourself, the old mind, heart, will, fighting against the Spirit of God that is now in you, who says, no, 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 that's not the way you're supposed to behave. That's not the way you're supposed to think. That's not the way you're supposed to feel. And so the struggle ensues because there is a conflict. There's a battle of two wills. But this also explains why your transformation is proportional to your surrender to God's Spirit. Your change, my change from old to new, is linked to how much I give myself over to God who lives now in and with me. If I hang on to my old mind, my old will, my old heart, my old body, 
and I don't yield to Him, I don't submit to Him, I don't say yes to God more when He changing my mind and changing my view and changing my heart and my body, then obviously I look the same. But the more I let go and let God am controlled by God's love, the more I live for God, the bigger the difference you see from the before and the after. Does this make sense? And so when we reach verse 17, we see that if anyone is in Christ, anyone, that person is a new creation. The difference is this. Before you were and I were without the Spirit of God. We were merely natural. Merely a soul in a body. Merely flesh. Observable, yes, by the world. We are merely worldly, natural. But from one point onwards, when God poured His Spirit into our lives, now we are a new spirit creature. The body is still there, the heart and the mind, the will are still there, but now, added to me and perfectly integrated into me is this person called the Spirit of God. And so I am a spiritual new creature from that point onwards. Now, I struggle to put this in a illustration so that we can explain to other people or we can help ourselves understand it ourselves. I started to think, okay, what does it look like to have an old person and a new person come into me? Maybe like, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, oh, no, 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 bad, bad, bad idea. No, you're not a split personality because God and you are fused together. The Bible tells us we are joined with Him, united in Him. Every fiber of your being is joined with His. It's not a split, schizophrenic person. Today I'm like God, tomorrow I'm not. No, it must be melded together. So I thought, okay, it looks like when you give someone a DNA injection, that's one of the medical treatments that we have now for very serious bodily diseases. You can actually insert DNA, healthy DNA into someone, and that DNA will start to take place in all, take its place in all the cells of your body, and as it re- reproduces, now you have a functioning, healthy body according to that new DNA. Some of you are thinking, oh, this sounds like X-Men, Marvel, like you're a mutant. Well, in a way, lah, but every illustration has its limits, huh? But yeah, you take on a new ability. You take on the new character. You take on that new thing that has been placed in you. That spiritual reality in you. Yes, not too bad. And then I thought, okay, let's, let's try this. This, this. this might help us to understand. Here is Jeremiah's water. Let's say you and I, this represents you and I. Here am I, just plain old, Water, okay? So, mind, will, heart in a body. And let's, let's pretend, uh, again, there's no perfect illustration, right? Well, let's, let's imagine that we could summarize the essence of God, His, his character, his, his, his attributes, His spirit with a concentrated solution like milk powder. And what happens if you take... Sometimes it's hard to... What happens if you take the Spirit of God and you allow Him to fill your life? Not as a schizophrenic split personality. What happens if God permeates every aspect of your life from your mind to your heart to your will that's all your soul by the way even to your body and what happens if he's truly, he's truly in every part, you are baptized. He truly fills every part of you. The outcome is, you take on the same substance or content as God is. Right? 
You are a spiritual being. I am a spiritual being. This now is milk, not water. I am, as God is spirit, I am a spiritual new being. This is so different from a moment ago that you can say this is not the same anymore. This is a new thing. This is milk. This is not water. But again, of course, you can say, okay, we can evaporate. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Every illustration having its own problems. But the Bible puts it simply. The Bible says, you are now two persons in one. God is in you, and you are in God. You're so perfectly integrated and mixed that the old is so different from the new. It's unrecognizable from the old. No one's going to mistake milk and water. But that's only if what is true of what God is saying here in His Word, if you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. The turning point is when Christ, in our perspective, was no longer just a human person, but truly the Son of God, full of the Spirit, our Saviour. That turning point when you stop seeing Christ in the old, but you saw Him in the new, is also the point in which you and I have gone from old to new. The difference is you were, I was, without the Spirit. I had a soul, I had a body. But today, not only do I still have a soul and a body, I have the Spirit in me, with me, in every way integrated in me. Paul says, verse 18, all of this is from God and from that point on, you and I have been reconciled to God through Christ. I'm now family with God. I'm now a friend of God. I'm no longer an enemy. I have been made right. I have friendly, warm relations with God. Through Christ, Jesus is the one who justifies who declared me innocent. Jesus is the one who makes it possible for God to forgive me, past, present and future. Christ Jesus is still the one who through his love for me and through my living for him will transform me more and more day by day that eventually the difference will be vast. I am already a new creature. And yet God is changing me to be even more like Him. Verse 18 tells us, not only have we been reconciled to Christ, we are now also ministers of reconciliation. He's given us the service of calling people back into right relationship with one another and with Him. Verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and there is justification, not counting men's sins against them and he has entrusted or committed to us this message, this story, true story account. Not fictitious, not made up for a movie or Facebook story or video, not just emotional and just decorated to move your hearts and your minds, but it's a true story life-changing story of being right again with God. What is all? Simply put, you and I, spiritless. You and I, no spirit. Or you and I, unspiritual. Choose the most That person, that me without the Spirit is gone. That's history. That person's passed on. Look around for a Joshua without the Holy Spirit today. Look for a Joshua, Su Jian Hao, without the Spirit today. You can't find him. He's dead. He's gone. He's buried. What's new? Same Joshua. Still look the same. I didn't lose weight overnight. 
same body, same mind, same heart, same will, but with the Spirit of God in every fibre of my being. What's new? I, in the Spirit, the Spirit in me. I join with Christ. This is a new creature. Still changing, but unrecognizable from the past prayerfully because I have the Spirit in me for sure. And He's not leaving me in a hurry. He's not leaving me at all. Full stop. God says, in Him, Spirit is here to stay. The old is gone. The new has come. Am I still the old me? Yes and no. Am I totally new? Yes and no. What difference does it make? Here's the difference. All those highlighted words, they're all verbs. They're all action words. I'm a new creature that still needs to be changed. But already, at that point, when Christ came into me, when His Spirit came into my life, and He joined me with Him in His very substance of spiritualness, not non-spiritual. That moment on, Christ's love begins to control me. The more I know the love of Christ for me, the more that control is driven and is enveloped, stems from love for God and love God's love for me. I live for God. Yes, there's still parts of my life that I still live for myself. But God is asking me, more and more, bring every aspect of my life into submission to Him. Make everything about me tied to Him. How I take my holidays, who I hang out with, the school that I will choose, the way I will spend my money, the way I will express my sexuality, the etc, etc, etc. Everything. Let my marriage be how God wants it to be. Let my parenting be how God guides me to be. Let everything about me be about God as His love compels and controls me. No longer do I live for myself. I now live to God, with God, for God. Motivated by His love, guided by Him, the one other thing that is different is that now I'm a minister of reconciliation. I bring people together and more importantly, I bring people to God. If, you're, if you just come to mind now, Matthew 5, yes, blessed are the peacemakers, exactly. Blessed indeed are you when you make peace with people to people, but imagine if you make peace between people and God. You bring people to Jesus and you show them not to see Him from a human perspective anymore, but from a spiritual, a supernatural perspective. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. From that moment, their lives take on a new trajectory. They are also new creatures, spiritual like you and I. What's old? The you without the Spirit, apart from God. Couldn't care less. Couldn't be bothered. What's new? You, with God, in you, this moment, always. Don't forget that. If you understand that, then now you can live in your newness, compelled by God's love, living for Him, and ministering as an ambassador of God, bringing people into reconciliation for Him. It's 
his story in your story that you are linking and telling others for their story. It's that simple. Chinese New Year is a time when we focus a lot on restoring, renewing, etc., etc. Reunion. Before we go into that cultural celebration, I want you to think about your spiritual situation. Think about who we were before without the Spirit. I think about who you are today with the Spirit. Leave the old behind. The old is gone. The new has come. And walk and live in the Spirit who is in you. You may ask me, how do I walk and live in the Spirit? I like to say, that's what we've been talking about all this time. And ask you to review all the words that God has been speaking to us through His messages to us. How do I walk with Him? Three vital connections. Prayer, Word, and allowing His Spirit to change our minds, our hearts, our wills. But what if I can't get a connection with Him? What if I doubt that He's for real? We talked about that too. Recall your history with Jesus. Remember that Jesus wants to help you to have faith. He gives you evidence today that He still wants you to believe in Him. And then, after it all, know that believing before you see is even better. It's a great blessing. How do I live my whole life for God? One of the professors of Biola Institute, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, he shared with us, he says, you want to live your life for God? Go seek his opinion about everything about your life. He challenges us. Go ask God's opinion about your life partner. Go ask God's opinion about your choice of career. Go ask God's opinion through prayer, through the word, and through the body of believers, go ask as His Spirit ministers and guides to us. Go ask His opinion and go follow it. And then you say, how can I be a minister for God? How can I serve in the Spirit? Paul says, well, you make friends you gain their trust, you call them near to God, and even sometimes you beg. As you pray, you implore them, come to Christ, be reconciled to God. You make friends, you gain their trust, you share with them the call of God to you and for them, and perhaps sometimes you may even need to implore them. Hey, bro, listen to me, man. If anyone is in Christ, he, she, is a new creature. Old is gone, the new has come. Let us understand and live in our newness, walk in our newness, every one of us who is in Christ. Would it be too early to say, Would it be too early to say, Made new with Christ, by His Spirit, walk also in Him. Let's pray. Abba, Father, I pray for us now, myself and all my spiritual family here. As Paul prayed for the church at Corinth and all the believers everywhere in Greece, 
that we will realize that Christ Jesus is in us. We will realize that you are in us. And that the old us without you is gone never to return. But now and forevermore, we live as new creatures, spiritual, you in us. We covenant, therefore, to you our thoughts and thinking processes, our feelings and emotional responses, our choosing, our desires, our priorities, our will. We choose now. We covenant now to yield to your spirit, to yield to you. So that even as our outward body wastes away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Lord, do this that we may shine as light. We may be useful as salt. As we reflect your glory, made in your image, not only in the natural, but also in the supernatural Help us understand this for ourselves and this also for our family and our friends, for strangers and for anyone else whom you will place in our lives to call them to reconciliation with you. This we pray, Lord, in your own name, who works powerfully in us, for we are new creatures. Amen. Well, dear church, walk in newness and uh, bless New Year in advance as we see each other uh, on the third day together again uh, here.